Hello, streaming conscious friends. We're on tonight. You're here. Facebook's over there. Uh, before this is all over, there'll be thousands of people listening, not just now, but in the archives. You'll go back. Some of you are putting your tele- your favorite shows like Scandal and all that stuff on. Uh, you're recording it to, to be live, but some of you are watching me, and you're going to do it. And want, uh, uh, you, you're watching Scandal, and you're going to watch me later. And that's fine. I said Scandal, but there's a lot of other stuff on television. Um, I'm 65 on my next birthday, and I'm continually and consistently... Uh, going through transitions. Even from the time I wrote the book, The Gospel of Inclusion, which was about 15 years ago, I've had pretty remarkable shiftings and evolutions. Uh, I'm, I, if I am a Christian, I would be a Christian universalist, one who believes that in the finished work of the cross, all of humanity's sins and sinners are atoned for, so therefore nobody's going to hell. Uh, first, I believed in hell. I just didn't believe anybody would be there. Now, I don't even believe in that concept which I'm just going to, I've been sort of avoiding saying these things directly because they are quite offensive and shocking to people. I have some of the sweetest people who are concerned for my soul. They're writing and texting and emailing and calling. And We're praying for you, Pastor. We're praying for you, Cardinal. I'm still praying for you. Some of my old college friends, we're praying that God will bring you back from your reprobate mind and that uh, you'll come back from the deep end and be the man of God we know God called you to be. And I understand all that. I lived in that world at that street address, and I appreciate the loving concern, honest concern that many friends have have for me. But I'm not going back. Uh, And that's not an arrogant statement. My soul will not allow me to return to the mentality, the spiritual paradigm that I once was in. It served a meaningful, significant, in my opinion, powerful purpose in my life the first 50 years of my life. I'm 15 years into the Last half, not the second half years on this is the last half of my life. The first half, I was significant in influencing the church world, particularly the Pentecostal fundamentalist Christian Protestant uh, and some Catholic and the evangelical world and a lot of the Pentecostal and full gospel world. This time I'm going to be more I, I feel that my calling and coding and I'll say I, I posted that today about tonight's program is to have greater impact on the world, not the church world, the secular world. And the sacred world within the secular world, beyond religion. There is a thriving spiritual community beyond the ecclesia or the, uh, the um, curiacus, which is the assembly of the church, the congregations. There is a church without walls and a church outside the walls. There is an ecclesia, that's the term that Jesus used, the Greek term, when, when saying, upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia. Ek meaning out of classes is the calling or the summons. There's a lot of people who are called out of darkness or obscurity into the marvelous illumination of light who are not Christians and may not be Buddhist or Muslims or Jews. Uh, They may be what we would call an atheist with regards to the biblical Bible. They don't believe God. They don't believe the God of the Bible. They believe in God, but not the God of the Bible. And I'm going to tell you why uh, when I deal with this anger management issues that this God has and the way he treats his people scripturally. Something that I've wrestled with. So one of my most sincere callings I posted today and objectives in this last half of my life and uh, after nearly 50 years of active uh, licensed and ordained ministry as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a bishop in what is called the Lord's Church, particularly the Pentecostal branch of fundamentalism uh, and evangelical Christian entity that I was born in, my purpose this time is to encourage and assist people who are eager to shift away in consciousness from the traditional model, mindset, or modality of the primitive Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, that their, their particular concept, Christianity, is, uh, Judaism, and Islam's concept of, a, of an angry, jealous, competitive, and paranoid God Uh, And to shift to a less personal and more principled reality of infinite love, infinite good, and infinite evolution. An infinite God that does not finish. An evolving, ageless, spaceless, timeless, nameless, faceless reality that you can call God if you want to. God's a title, not a name. God has several names, but the title God 
is a, a reference to some, I believe in a supreme being or a supreme reality or a supreme intelligence or a supreme energy. Most people personalize it to a man or a woman or gods, a plurality. Even the, the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, uh, opens up with in beginning gods created. Not in beginning God, but in beginning gods, a plurality of gods, or continuum uh, of gods. Uh, could have been male and female gods, for all we know. So um, that's very important for you to recognize. So I'm, I'm really eager to, to get away from this, this, this angry, judgmental, wrathful, vengeant God, because people who believe in that God take on those personality traits of vengefulness, vengeance, and anger, and wrath, and, and unforgiveness, and judgmentalness. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. When you're into that kind of perception of God, you take on those, those moral and emotional and, and uh, personality traits. And what has really spurred me on, and I'm not going to talk about Trump and evangelicals as much, but that whole movement was a really were real waker call for me, more than I've had in the last 15 years with my so-called gospel of inclusion. I see now why, when, when, when Bishop Ellis said to me, my daddy been in hell, and I asked him if he could, would he get his dad out? He said, I don't know, I can't answer that. The same feeling I had from him that day, I now have, uh, with when I see evangelical Christians following this, this uh, passionate ideologue, you know, Donald Trump, he makes, it makes no sense. It's the most ludicrous and the most, most unethical mistake or misstep this country has ever made, even though all things I know will work together and somehow some good will come out of it. One thing is that it exposes the church for what it is and what it isn't. And I've been in that church all my life. And so I've made a clear decision that that's not going to be the way I think. I have many, many friends that are in there. i got most of my family, still evangelical Pentecostal preacher, preachers, I mean, Christians, I start to say creatures, because that, fit, that fits. Uh, I still have my, I call myself a metacostal or unicostal. I'll explain that later. But um, I've expanded, and I think that I want to give other people at least permission, maybe an incentive to expand as well, because I'm hearing from thousands and thousands of people. Um, so we don't want to repeat and replenish uh, the prevailing traditions of uh, this angry God. We've got to get away from that. That's the, the, the number one move toward peace on this planet, is to get away from worshiping, idolizing, if you will, an invisible entity that you think is almighty, uh, all-powerful, omnipotent, everywhere present and all-knowing, and that God is angry and unforgiving and will hold several thousand-year grudges against billions of people and then torture them infinitely in a customized torture chamber called hell where they will weep well and gnash of I know that's in the Bible I don't I take the Bible seriously but not literally I, I think there's a if you don't approach it metaphysically and metaphorically uh, as it sells itself the letter or the literal kills spirit gives life if you have a literal uh, interpretation of scripture then you're mentally ill you have to be you have to be schizophrenic you have to have some some mental instability uh you have to be. You have to have two loyalties. Your Bible tells you not to live off the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God and devil. But we do that, and when you are aware of that, you do it, and you continue. I think there's an erosion and a deterioration of the consciousness and of the brain. So many people are walking around unconscious, and I think the thing that'll bring peace. We're looking at possibly a World War III, a nuclear holocaust of some type, with with the North Korea and Donald Trump. Because it's not America threatening him; it's Donald Trump threatening him. It's not the American Congress. It's not the Supreme Court. It's not the American populace that are saying those kinds of things to, uh, to North Korea. It is Donald Trump making these threats out of his ego and his testosterone-driven passion to be king of kings and lord of lords. And his followers are helping him do that. So my evolved and expanded consciousness about God or source or divine mind or spirit um, today is a metacostal um, and that, as a metacostal, is, is that, and when I say metacostal, I mean I'm embracing metaphysics and Pentecostalism, the transcendent aspect of Pentecostal 
and, and relating to people in their languages, their cultures, their ideologies. I can relate to fundamentalism. I'm also relating now to Judaism and aspects of Islam and Zen Buddhism and yoga and Reiki therapy and energy healing and uh, meditation. I'm interested in all that and I see aspects of the God or divine mind in all of them. And I would like to see us all come together in some wonderful worship experience at some point and uh, be friendlier and meet one another and talk with one another and eat with one another. Not just shake hands, but sit down and eat together, have supper and share each other's uh, diets and uh, talk about each other's dogmas. That will bring some beautiful peace on the planet. And I think God would honor that in the most uh, profound ways. So... A metacostal is sometimes, I say, I could call myself a unicostal. As one, my focus on bridging spirituality and science, uh, my focus is on, on bridging spirituality and bridging to science and intellectual growth and emotional awareness, mind and body, the synchronicity in all of that, spirit, mind and body. Um, to experience with freedom and to think and create meaning without the constraints of doctrines or harsh and demanding dogma. Um, and by dogma, I mean a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly and unquestionably true, including the demeaning and demanding uh, so-called disciplines that are purport and uh, they purport to define or confine uh, a person to orthodoxy. Orthos means straight, doxy is doctrine. Doctrine, like orthodontics, straightens the teeth or the truth. <laughs> so um, there are truths out there that we've not related to yet. There are facts that are coming on very rapidly into our mindsets, into our cultures that aren't true to us now, but they've always been, but we didn't know they were. And we're discovering and uncovering and recovering truths about ourselves that are very powerful. And people are uh, eager to learn. If you're uncomfortable and restless, it's because you haven't paused long enough to go within to your own soul, which carries the syllabus of the life course and class that you're here and cause that you're here to, to expedite. We are all here because we know something, but we have forgotten it. And so in this new age, and I know many Christians and are afraid of the term, this is a new age. This is a new day. You're always talking about the world is changing. Things ain't like they used to be. Ooh, well, that means it's a new age. It's a new day. It's a new time. It's a new season. Don't fight it because when you fight it, you only invite it and incite it and ignite it. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you're trying to fight it. Uh, this is the time when you need to go with the flow and grow with the flow and learn what that flow or fluidity or even flood is. There's a flood of change. There is a flow of change. There is a fluid move in consciousness globally. And I'm so thrilled in this last half of my life to be one of the enhancers, be one of the midwives to help this thing birth into our, our culture. I think I'll live a long, healthy life because of the calling on my life to do that in this last half. It's, it's, it's uh, beautiful. So um, I, I want us to, I want to help create uh, and identify spiritual progressives, cultural creatives, sacred activists. We need to deprogram first, then reprogram our minds, our, our thoughts, our ways of thinking and our ways of being. When I say cultural creatives, I mean they're described as is a, a term that's coined by sociologist Ray, uh, Paul H. Ray, and I met him. He's a genius. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. And the psychologist Sherry Ruth Anderson to describe a large segment of the Western society that has developed mentally and spiritually beyond the standard paradigm of modernists or conservatives. We're not locked in either of those words. We're not locked into just the modern tradition of the day or the conservative traditions of yesterday. We have expanded beyond that in the way we think, in the way we experience ourselves, the way we express ourselves, and the way we expose ourselves. There's far less fear and, and intimidation in the cultural creatives, or the millennials are also that, the indigo children, 
they're fearless, they're courageous, they do daring, sometimes reckless things and treacherous things. But they come up with amazing evolutions and creations and inventions, first in consciousness and then in culture. They are deciding how they want to live and it's not the way we taught them. And I'm not angry. I'm not frustrated. I'm not upset that my children are not little church kids like I was. I learn a lot from my children and I listen to them. They don't please me 100%. They don't do all the things uh, that I would want them to do and they do a lot of things I might not, might not want them to do. I was a pretty straight-laced kid coming up. I mean, I was a little hole in this boy and I never broke the rules very seldom and I did, but I mean, not like a lot of my friends that were just gone hog wild and crazy. I was very careful and dareful and, and, and uh, uh, careful and fearful that I wouldn't miss the will of God or fall out of the will of God or lose my anointing or my appointing. And that's still important to me, but not I don't have the fear about it or the paranoia that I once did. Now, our English word for religion, I'm going to talk about tonight, that tonight, uh, comes from a Latin wor word that is religare. And it means to hold back or to bind or to bind fast. It's from an old French word uh, that, that suggests obligation or bonds bondage and reverence um, it's based on the Latin word that means to bind so religion is binding religion is bondage religion is containing restraining controlling and there are there are five major religions in the world that the bulk of the billion seven billion people embrace are embraced by they're very competitive uh, but they're also more competitive Imperative. There's a lot of similarities in all of them, similarities in all of them. And uh, but people are now the new generations are moving away from those mindsets. The Greek New Testament uses of the word religion. There, there are two new words prominent. One is threskia, uh, which signifies the external aspect of ceremonial rites and rituals and liturgical worship services. And then uh, uh, and Treskos is a religious person who is very careful about these, these externals from uh, the religious service to diet and wardrobe and holidays and holy days and fast days and feast days and all that kind of thing. Uh, again, that's not the church that Jesus built, built his consciousness upon. It was the Christ consciousness is Krishna had it, Buddha had it, people who preceded Jesus by thousands of years. They were aware of the sent ones or the sent message or the sent meaning or the sent significance that the, they believed in the, their ordained purpose and that everything had an ordained purpose. I call that messianic consciousness. Uh, that we all have a Christ operating in us when we permit it to. It doesn't force itself upon us. Uh, but it is an appetite in all of us. It's, it's laughter. Uh, in all of us. It's spontaneity in all of us. It's creativity in all of us. It's uh, synchronicity and cadence in all of us. It's passion and compassion and desire. And it allows itself to be disturbed. It allows disruption and interruption from the traditional flow. You got to be willing to be disturbed, willing to be interrupted. Not necessarily corrupted, but disrupted. You need to be affected, not defected or infected, but affected by the, the charm of the times, the charm of the energy of this day, of the electricity, of the automation, of, of the demonstration, of the creations that are here. I'm so fascinated with these phones. I, I say, all you, all you folks scared about the mark of the beast, if you got a cell phone, you got the mark of the beast. <laughs> If you own one of these, you know, Big Brother has got you, and uh, you, there's, no way, there's no escape. And remember, mine, I'm doing, I'm, 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 doing my live, I'm doing my live stream right now, sweetheart. I'm doing the live stream, but I didn't want you to know. No, no. I love you. Bye. That's my baby. She's calling. I'll call you later. Bye, okay. All right, okay, bye. Love you, bye. Bye. <laughs> now, she should know I do my live. I do my live stream every Thursday night. I was playing with the phone, and, and uh, her name came up. Um. The other word for religion is desedemonia. Diedo in Greek means to fear or reverence a demon or demon, a pagan deity or entity. 
uh, King Festus ref, uh, made that reference to Paul. And he said, I sense that you're a very religious person. He actually said superstitious in Greek, in the Greek translation. You, you fear the entities or you reverence energies or powers or demons, gods with a little g, angels, uh, angles. You, are, you, you have a certain fear of the unknown. You have a fear of the suspicious, uh, of the questions and the queries. Uh, a lot of people, in fact, most folk who go to church are superstitious. First of all, we fear God. I'm trying to get away from that particular image of a God who needs to be feared uh, or a God who could actually be angered, that little me, or you could actually tick God off enough for him to send a tornado or uh, to put cancer on me. Or I think I can do things with my body, starting with digging my grave with my fork and make myself sick with overeating or over drinking or the substance I put in that I, that I ingest or um, digest or imbibe. Uh, we can bring these. There are, there are choices and decisions with con sequences or sequels. There's a sequel or sequence to everything we do. It's not God judging us. It's crea creation following its own rules and nature. The cosmic energies. There's certain things if you eat too much sugar, sugar or too much sodium, um, too much uh, carbohydrates and not enough proteins and not enough exercise and not enough sleep and too much alcohol. Even the scripture says, be not filled with wine wherein it is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Didn't say don't drink wine, just don't drunk. Don't get drunk with wine. Be not filled with wine where until you're the place that you're drunk. Okay? So this word desidemonia, as the King James uh, translates as superstition, is based in fear of things that go bump in the night, even if it's the Holy Ghost. The only reason we, the Bible refers to the Holy Ghost is because that's, those writers believed in unholy ghosts. Uh, zeitgeist. <laughs> they believed in, in, in geist, in whether they were holy or, or unholy. They believed in spirits and energies that were negative and positive, and, and they feared them. But the one they feared the most was their God, because their God was was vicious and terrible, particularly of the Abrahamic faiths and everywhere, and knows what you're doing and what you're thinking and could catch you with your work, on, work undone and kill you and torture you and torment you and put you in chains. Let me jump to a, um, to a scripture I wanted to get to before I finish tonight. Uh, they're all kind of myths and mythologies, and I'm going to carry this on for a while. I'm going to, I'm going to take my time and, and, and respect my assignment to help bring millions of people out of religious bondage, out of the mental paralysis and, and, and the, the catatonic state, the zombieism, the walking dead that so many religious people have become. Um, there's a huge change out there and it's a powerful change and the, a Pew report say that in recent years, Christians have had a disproportionately large share of the world's deaths. 37% of the deaths on this planet in the last years have been Christians. They're dying faster and in larger numbers than any other world religion. In large part because of the relatively advanced uh, age of Christian populations in some places, particularly in Europe. Um, there's a number of, uh, of deaths already estimated in Europe to, to exceed the number of births among Christians. There are, there, you got more Christians dying than Christians b being birthed. So the numbers are shrinking. In places like Israel, the Hasidic Jews, the very Orthodox Jews, are having multiple times more children than the Reformed or Progressive Jews. So that eventually the Hasidic Jews or the more Orthodox Jews can outvote the other Jews and control the Knesset and keep Israel a, a religious state. Um, and, 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 and in a, a religious status. Well, Christians, and I'm not saying go out of church and start having babies because I think Christianity and the world religions as we've known them are going to begin to, to dissolve, not evolve, but dissolve. And if they do evolve, they will evolve away from the extremities that they have become. So um, in Europe, you've got 
the number of deaths already estimated to exceed the number of births among Christians. In Germany alone, for example, there were an estimated 1.4 million more Christian deaths than births between 2010, 2010 and 2015, a pattern that is expected to continue across much of Europe in the decades ahead. Now remember, Europe was a predominantly Catholic continent because of the Roman Catholic influence. And there were Protestants or Protestants there as well, those who protested Catholicism. Those numbers have never been as large, like a billion, of the Roman Catholic influences. The Catholic Church was actually falling off by millions until this new Pope Francis came in with a more progressive approach, saying things like atheists might be in heaven and that gay people should be able to participate in the worship experience. And he's not quite ordaining women, but he's talking about it at least. Um, so this, this report that I'm reading uh, generally avoids terms such as Christian babies and Muslim babies. It means babies born to Christians or babies born to Muslims. And then many of them are changing as they get a little older. So uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, observation that, that the Christian religion as we've known it numerically is shrinking. One of the things that has alarmist over here in the Trump camp or the ultra religious conservative camp is that their numbers are shrinking. Particularly white people, their ethnic numbers, the Anglo mindset from Britain. White people are being outnumbered and 30 years from now whites or Caucasian race in America will be the minority race because African Americans, Asian Americans, uh, Native Americans Latin Americans, all these ethnic groups from around the world are pouring in here. That's why they want to put up these walls and start blocking uh, certain people of olive colored skin. Trump says they're Muslim terrorist nations, but they're really afraid of the religion and they're afraid of the color and character of those people outnumbering uh, white Americans. There's a big portion of the Christian movement toward Trump that's based in racism and bigotry. I just have to tell you that. That's probably the most pronounced disappointment of my Christian experience of the 50 or so years that I've been an ordained, licensed minister in the fundamentalist Christian Pentecostal movement. Uh, I'm not devastated, but I am stunned by what I see, and it repeats itself. Trump's grandiose incendiary and, and vitriolic statements are made only to stir up his base, who are mostly evangelical Christians. He says what he thinks they want to hear, regardless of how absurd and ludicrous it is. That's how he estimates that group. And he's not one of you. He's not a fundamentalist Christian. He's not even a conservative. He is a racist. He's a narcissist. He's an arrogant, self-centered, and self-serving egotist. He's not a Christian in the sense that the term normally suggests. Oh, my, I had a lot of those preacher friends that went there and said, yeah, he's a Christian. You know, that... That doesn't mean a lot to me anymore. In fact, it means less than it's ever meant in my life. Um, anyway, uh, globally, the relatively young population of high fertility rates of, of Muslims lead to a projection that between 2030 and 2035, there will be slightly more babies born to Muslims, about 225 million, than to Christians, 224 million. And that's small even though the total Christian population will still be larger. I bring up those two religions and they're interesting to me because they're the most aggressive religions on the planet. They are the proselyters, proselytizers and the evangelists. I mean, they're spreading. In fact, Islam is the fastest spreading religion on the planet. Pentecostal Christianity is the fastest uh, spreading form of Christianity on the planet. Everybody wants to get Africa saved. Some of you have heard me say there are more Christians in Africa than there are people on the North American continent. Africans have churches of millions, not, I mean, we, all the mega churches on in America, the most of them are in Africa. You know, 20, 30,000, that's not a mega church over there. They have 100,000, 500,000, up to a million in their movements over there. And their Christian movements, some of them de are a little devious or deviant, and they get into all kind of cultisms, and they mix African juju in with, and uh, animism in with their Christianity, but so be it. Um... Now, in contrast with this baby boom, um, with this fact, baby boom among Muslims, people who do not identify with any religion are experiencing, this Pew report says, a much different trend. People who do not identify with any religion. Now, 
you couldn't you could count those on you know two hands and, and two feet uh, just a few years ago. Even here in Tulsa, there are a lot of people who are not into any religion. They're not evangelical Pentecostals and Protestants or Catholics. They don't go to any church. They have fun. <laughs> They're at the beaches or the lakes and the parks on Sundays, or they go to their little restaurants or private places. Sometimes they burn candles or they hug a tree. Or they dig a hole of dirt, you know, they're in a new age. and Or they meditate and they listen to oriental music or smooth jazz, which is my favorite. But they're not going to go to anybody's church. They're not going to genuflect. They're not going to use holy water. They're not going to read a scripture or quote a scripture. They ain't going to quote a scripture or tote a Bible. They don't believe in demons the way you've been taught. They don't believe in devils the way we've been taught. I'm talking about millions of people in the Western world, especially right here in America. There's a major shift, a major change. I don't want to plug into that frequency. I don't want to fight that. I want to flow with that and flow into that. Uh, this is not a time to be fighting uh, what the change that is occurring. Don't freak out over it. And people are. I'm not. If they, if pot becomes legalized, gay marriage is legalized, um, if uh, abortion rights is restored and funded by government f facilities or a woman's choice, uh, that doesn't intimidate me <clears throat> because I no longer allow, quote unquote, your devil intimidate me. So if I don't allow your devil, the hairy horned, hoofed, uh, you know, hybrid male, man and animal devil that so many Christians believe in, if that doesn't intimidate me, and it once did, if that doesn't intimidate me, what you all call sins, and I'm not calling all these things sins. You think freedom is sin. Uh, I can talk about sin. I can preach about sin. I know the scriptures on sin. I know the consciousness of sin. I know the victim and guilt consciousness of most religious people. It's not working for me anymore. And it's, de it's, it's deteriorating and, and has deteriorated so many people who do believe in that. So there's a great change taking place. I want to see everybody free. I really feel that's my calling. I don't just feel it. Folks, I know this. It's in me. It manifests as me. I can't get away from it. I know some of you get tired. I've lost probably thousands of friends or people have unfriended me because of my present stance. But I'm garnering and gaining others who are in this new flow. And uh, I'm not intimidated by somebody who smokes a joint or has a glass of wine. I have a glass of wine. I'm not inf intimidated by a couple that is not married but is living together or a gay couple that is married and living together. I'm not intimidated by... Um, um, the normal things we would have called sin. That doesn't mean I endorse everything that's out there. Uh, I don't condemn and I don't condone everything. But I don't fight like I used to. And people who fight are alarmed or angry. Anger is a signal emotion. It signals there is emotion, commotion, and devotion in your life that hasn't been dealt with properly. So... While religiously unaffiliated people currently make up about 16% of the global population, only an estimated 10% of the world's newborns between 210 and 215 were born to religiously unaffiliated mothers. Only a small percentage of comparatively. People are still into religion. Religion is going to last as it is another 50 to 100 years before we actually see it conspicuously absent. You will see it um, diminishing and shrinking and uh, deflating, but it'll still be around. But our parents and grandparents, my grandparents are all gone. My, my parents are in their 80s. My dad's gone. Mama's 88. Uh, that generation are the ones that, and my mother has Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker and Paul Crouch Jr. and TVN and all and, and Date Star and all these and I helped I, I did telethons and raised helped raise millions of dollars for all those television stations from Pat Robertson to Paul and Jan Krause to Jim and Tammy Baker. I sat on those programs. I hosted a lot of them. I, were, I was guest. I hosted more than I was guest. I sang. I preached. I loved it. Flew all over the world. Sometimes on private jets. Stayed in posh hotels. Big comfortable beds and sheets and pillows and towels so thick where I could not even fit them in a suitcase. Uh, <laughs> we had a blast. I don't regret any of it. I was doing my thing and I felt anointed and appointed to do it. That it changed, 
You know, I don't have anything to do with that. It evolved in me like hair thinning or thickening and uh, skin wrinkling, you know, uh, straining a little bit to see or pee. <laughs> you know, I'm aging, I'm maturing, and I like what's happening. I like what used to be, I like what is. So this dearth of newborns among the unaffiliated helps explain why religious nuns, non-religious people, including people who identify as atheists or agnostics, as well as those who have no particular religion, are projected to decline. Um, because they're being born to mothers who are still religious, but they're not sticking with their parents' religions. They are becoming less religious. Uh, they are less interested in church or Sunday school or youth groups. And all these denominations are still trying to do things in the 21st century the, the way you did it in the 20th century. You're realizing that it's not working. Things are slowing down. There's less participation. And even if there is participation, there's less emotion. There's less energy. There's less interest. It's dull. People don't sing like the hymns like they used to with passion and the tears and the intensity. And they don't transform. It's not transcendent. It's just repetitive. And people are saying, why don't I enjoy this anymore? It's like going to your favorite restaurant. You've been going to that restaurant for 10 years, almost religiously. And, all, and the menu is the same. Uh, your favorite recipe is there. But it doesn't taste, it doesn't taste bad. It just doesn't taste. It doesn't do anything for you. And you're wondering why. Yet, yet you keep going to that restaurant. That's your favorite. You know the, the uh, waiters and waitresses and the owner or the bartender. You're, you know all that stuff, but nothing feels the same. Millions of people are experiencing that and they're having to make a change. Now, in the next uh, few minutes, I want to get down to a scripture in Exodus that shows you why I don't believe in the biblical God. I believe what's written, that it is written, that it's in a book or biblios, a Bible, that it's considered sacred, and, and uh, holy writ. I don't necessarily think it's the inspired word of God, but I think it is probably the inspired word of man about God. And some of that now has expired, has become increasingly insignificant and immaterial. It doesn't count. It's non-consequential, except for negatives. But anyway, Moses, the 19th chapter, Moses has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They're now a 50 days journey uh, into the Sinai Desert, where is the Sinai Mountain, upon which Moses would receive the Ten Commandments, which ultimately became 611 commandments. And, and uh, that's a whole other subject. But the original ten were supposed to be literally written by the finger of God. Okay, I don't believe that, except I believe what's written there as being true to those who wrote it and those who believe it. That's in the Bible. Okay, I metaphysically, metaphorically, Allegorically, some of those things work. I love the scriptures. I read the scriptures. I teach and preach the scriptures. I'm one of the, I could be one of the most um, accurate Bible teachers you could have. And I'm going to be teaching some Bible courses or some courses on and or about the Bible that are going to make you understand uh, your God logic, which is your God thought and talk more. Theology, theologos, the logic of your Godness or divine mind. So, this is before the Ten Commandments are given, but God is manifesting himself. Now, children of Israel had lived in Egypt for 400 years, had become slaves. They made their entrance through Joseph, who was a son of um, uh, Jacob, and, and the, uh, the baby son, and he was the one that was sold into Egyptian slavery by his brothers, and put in an Egyptian prison, and you know, some of you know the story that Joseph uh, of, uh, the, had the coat of many colors and many cultures, Anyway, he became the prime minister and uh, Israelites or Hebrews started living and breeding in Egypt. And they almost started outnumbering the Egyptians. And so they got threatened by their, their numbers and made them slaves. But for 400 years, they lived a sort of catatonic life of slavery. They got comfortable with slavery. They got comfortable with the Egyptian diet, the Egyptian uh, culture, the Egyptian worship and gods and deities, the diet and the deities became theirs. You're talking 400 years. No temple, no synagogues, no commandments, no Moses, and no Abraham anymore. There was a generation that did not remember Joseph. 
in Egypt. The Bible says that. So then God shows up after 400 years uh, like, like a, a hurricane. I mean, blood and frogs and flies and lice and, and dead sons. And I mean, it was horrendous. And Moses now, who was raised for 40 years in Egypt by uh, the princess uh, of Ramses, uh, King Ramses, and uh, he's learned the culture. He's considered like one of the sons of the pharaohs. And so he has this dramatic change. You know, some of you know the story. Anyway, he's gotten the children of Israel out. He saw an Egyptian mistreating or abusing a Jew or Hebrew, and he got mad and killed the guy. So one of the greatest guys in the Bible began his ministry with murder. Okay, Moses. <laughs> he had a temper. Even with the Ten Commandments, he broke them before the children of Israel had a chance to. He saw them worshiping a cow and threw them down literally and broke all the commandments. <laughs> had to go back up there and get it a second time. He didn't even get to see the promised land because of his temper, according to the, to the narrative. So I'm in, the sixth, I'm in the 19th chapter. I'm going to get to the 20th in a little bit. I can't read all of it, but I want to read enough to show you how vicious th this particular interpretation and portrayal of God is. Last week I talked about the God who said, I repent that I made you. You're mortals. I'm done with this. I basically want a divorce from humanity, from the Earth, pro Earth Project. He sent the flood, killed everybody but eight people. And then Moses, Noah got out of the ark, got drunk, did some kind of incestuous act, supposedly, with his son in a tent, naked. And uh, then this th the spiral began again. And God said, next time we're not going to send water, we're going to burn him. Now, Moses. So Moses went down from this Mount Sinai to the people, there were maybe a couple of million or so of them, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes, because God said, I'm going to visit the people, go down there and get them clean. Already, this is, the fear's already started, they're already afraid of, terrorized by the God they saw in Egypt. Their God, denouncing the Egyptian gods. And he was violent, he was vicious. And the, the, the um, collateral damage of what he did was unforgettable in some ways unforgivable. They didn't like that God, but he was theirs. So now Moses is having this experience with God. Only God only talks to Moses, uh, not the people. He comes down, he says, okay, God's going to visit us. So God told me to tell y'all to get sanctified, wash your clothes. He said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Have no conjugal or intimate sexual relationship with your wives. I mean, sex is not holy. Uh, change your diet, wash your clothes, you got to be pure, God's coming. So they're pretty tense and nervous. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, uh, this is Exodus nineteen sixteen. that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. That's their encounter, first personal encounter with God other than the violence they'd seen in Egypt. God's going to visit us. And, and, and Moses, in the 17th chapter, says, uh, verse says, brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now the mountain's trembling, quaking. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's vapor, there's smoke. It's, they're terrorized. Now Mount Sinai was completely in, in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice and obviously by choice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and the top of the mountain, on the top of the mountain. So now God's very dramatic, very extravagant, very extreme, very bodacious, very braggadocious, I'm here. It's kind of like Trump at one of the first <laughs> European meetings when he walks in front of everybody, moves one of the prime ministers by, by, you know, I'm Mr. America, I'm the leader of the free world. He gets that, and his followers get that from this kind of portrayal of God. They think that's godly. That's power. We don't need a little soft-spoken Jesus now. We need God to come in with some hell, raise some hell, shake some stuff up stick folks up. Um, then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai and the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Not the people, just Moses. 
And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through a gay, to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. They can't see me. Warn them. They are not even to look in my direction. If they, get, if they see me, I'm going to break loose on them. Now, where's love? Where's tenderness? Where's uh, nurturing? Where's promise? Who wants a God like that? A lot of these Egypt, a lot of the uh, uh, children of Israel would rather to go back to the false gods of Egypt that didn't move. They just sat there, and folks was doing stuff, but they weren't. There was no smoke except smoke that the men had made. Uh, it wasn't blowing puff uh, billows of smoke and fire, and and sh there wasn't quaking. All this drama. They preferred the Egyptian gods, who seemed more subtle and kind and benevolent. Yes, they feared them, but not the way, not with the terror with which they feared their God. This God chose them. They didn't necessarily choose that God. In fact, I met a very powerful Jewish woman who heard in the city of, of, of uh, Tulsa who told me, who, who had just come, moved here from Israel. She said, listen, that old God, I fired that God. That Old Testament God, that old Jewish God, Hebrew God, I fired him. I, never, I don't teach my children about that God. This is power. I just come out with the inclusion message and she wanted to meet with me. Pretty powerful. And the Lord said to Moses, tell these folks, don't, 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 don't break through and gaze at me because you'll perish. Also, let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. Sound like Trump again. I'm going to get on. I'm going to have to find a conflict with everybody. Y'all do it my way or I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to have to cut somebody, cuss somebody, or kill somebody. I'm God. Now, that kind of arrogant, egotistic, fascist, narcissistic image of God is not a God I believe in or worship. Yes, I said it. The God of this Bible no longer works for me and I don't work for it or him. I work for God. I work as a God with a little g, as a deity. I recognize my infinity and the deity within that infinity. I recognize that I have always been and will always be in some form. Death is a different form or formula of life. Got me? But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate us like God forgot. And he's inviting at least the priests up. And he said, No, we're not supposed to go up there. It's like Trump forgetting to, to sign uh, one of those bills. He likes all the fanfare, all the crowd. Then he walks out and he did that two or three different times, forgot to sign it. The Lord said to Moses, away, get down and then come up. You and Aaron, with you. Now he's changing his mind. and He said, okay, first you, only you can come now. Uh, don't be telling me nothing. Get out of here. In fact, go down. Get your tail down there and bring Aaron up. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. This is in the Bible. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. Now, let's jump over the 20th chapter, where Moses is getting the Ten Commandments. He's up the mountain again. He kept going up the mountain. He evidently liked it up there with all that vapor and smoke and fear. I think it made him angrier and angrier and angrier. But I want to jump over because i got about 10 minutes. So, Ezekiel 20, 19. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, Moses now... Coming down, he hears, God says, get down the mountain. There's a, there's a sound down there that I don't like. You need to correct what's going on down there. Moses has been up there almost 40 days, and they think he's not coming back. And they said, this guy's not coming back. We need a God. We need an idol. We don't like the other one that we saw in Egypt. Let's create our own. So Joshua was a weak leader. And he said, all right, take the gold. All the boys and girls and, and women take the golds off. I presume some men had gold. Melt it, and we'll make a calf. Taurus. It was during the Taurus Zodiac period anyway. Um, so they made a calf, a, a golden calf. So Moses is going down the mountain, uh, and, and, and as soon as he came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. So the people were now, they were afraid of the other god, terrorized. Now they're dancing around this calf. This calf doesn't thunder, doesn't breathe fire. The calf is just there. They actually burnt the gold and created their own god. And so they're dancing. There's levity. They're happy again. So Moses' anger became hot. This prophet got ticked off. He's already killed a man. He has a fast anger. He probably had that all his life. Again, that's why he didn't get to go to the land of promise. He could see it. I've been to the mountaintop. He looked over and he saw, but he wasn't allowed to go. 
So his anger just went nuts. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. This is, he was so angry, he took God's finger etched commandments, all ten of them, and just said to hell with them, what the? He was hot. Then he took the calf, which they had made, burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Now, you're talking about a dictatorial ruler. This is Moses now. He just flipped his life. I mean, he's so ticked off. He breaks the Ten Commandments. He burns the other God, grinds it into powder, forces the people to drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you? that you have brought so great a sin upon them. What kind of leader are you, Joshua? You're my right-hand man, and you're so weak and gullible, you let the people tell you what to do. So Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. It was already hot. You know the people, they're, they're set on evil. They're hard, and he said, You know these people ain't right. They ain't never been right. They ain't going to be right. They're set on evil. They want their own way. I can't handle that, Joshua said. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. He's been gone over a month. Who has, uh, and I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now Moses saw the people were unrestrained, verse 25. For Aaron had not restrained them, religion. They were not religious enough. To their shame among their enemies. So now Moses saw that the people were unrestrained. For Aaron and had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Their enemies could see that the people had cast off restraint. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. Acting like they did in Egypt. No fear of God. Then Moses stood in the entrance to, of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. Now watch this. you got to hear this before you, you leave. Whoever is on the Lord's side... Come to me. I'm on the Lord's side. Make thee mighty God. That's the song I used to sing when I was kid in church. And all the sons of Levi, that's the Levitical priesthood, gathered themselves to him. So the preachers came over to Moses and said to them, he said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let every man, watch, he's going to get real violent, start packing, get his guns. He says, sword. They didn't have guns in those days. If they had guns, they would have been saying, Get guns. Let every man, Levitical man, put his sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. Become violent, vicious, merciless killers. These are the Levites that came to Moses, the prophet of God, that had been in the presence of an angry God, had taken on that anger, made the people drink gold dust, and then gave his leaders swords, said, get your own sword, and go kill every man your brother. He meant your physical, literal, biological brother. Every man your companion, that could be your wife, your partner in business, and every man his neighbor, his nearby. The people you know, you've grown your children together and walk together and, 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 and go to the river and fetch water, or the well and fetch water and bathe together and clean clothes together. And cook. Go kill them. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. There was a massacre. Not one God created, but God inspired because of fear. Or the man of God interpreted the fear of God to make that it should make people murder. We're doing that in America right now. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. For every man has opposed his son and his brother. You've gone to kill your own son, your own brother, your own partner, your own neighbor, and now the Lord is blessing you. This is where fundamentalists, and in any religion, especially the Abrahamic religions, get their warmongering spirit. That it's okay to kill the people God doesn't like. Christians killing Muslims. Muslims killing the infidels or Christians. Or killing the Jews. The chosen. Jewish people are not aggressive. They don't proselytize. 
They don't evangelize. They're much smaller than the other two Abrahamic religions. They're not aggressive. They want that one little strip of property, of real estate. They're surrounded by Palestinians and the Arab nations and the Muslim nations of the world. And I am I happen to be one that feels like they should have their own little land because they're surrounded from Lebanon all the way down to Egypt uh, by uh, their brothers, the sons of Ishmael. Um, I don't think they should kill for it. I don't think they should slay Palestinians for it. I don't think it should be as violent over there. But they think they're, that God gave it to them. And there are others, uh, Ishmael, who's Abraham's other first son, says that Ishmael might live under your blessing. He was saying, uh, and God said, okay, Ishmael, your kid born out of wedlock to Hagar, which means uh, deviate. Hagar, the Egyptian maid to your wife Sarah, who was impotent, or who was a uh, barren. Uh, Abraham loved that kid. Ishmael was somewhere between, I think, 14 and 16 years old when, when Isaac was born. So Abraham and Ishmael had an intimate father-son relationship, and Abraham didn't want to kill him. So he asked God to bless him. He sent him away, and he went. But he had 12 tribes, and they owned the oil fields of the Middle East, of Arabia, and Iran, and Iraq, and Jordan, and Syria, and Lebanon. Those are mostly sons of Ishmael. And Ishmael asked for, believed for, prayed for. They wanted a baby. And they prayed for a baby, even though it didn't come the normal way through Sarah. So, now these people, have, Moses has turned on the, on the Egyptians, but he now has Jew killing Jew. Father killing son. Brother killing brother. Because they disobeyed that angry, vicious, violent God. That whole scenario, I know I'm talking smack to some of you, we got to change it. It's not working. It's not going to work. Can you imagine a God that you can't anger or that doesn't get angry? Can you imagine a God with no commands and, and, and uh, codes of ethics and morality that if you violated them, he would kill you or beat you or punish you or rebuke you? Listen, the universe has its way of rebuking. Global warming, the way we've done with, with uh, uh, the, what we've done to the ozone layer and with, you know, smoke and vapor and, and automated energies. Um, the universe is, is melting in so many ways. There is global warm, warming. All this water, all this suds and floods, um, this is the sequence of putting trash in the ocean there's billions of tons of plastic and bottles and tires and cars and old stoves and refrigerators at the bottom of the ocean. We are a sloppy, junky, nasty people. And all of us have faith in a God who said, the, particularly the Jewish, Christian, Islamic God, said, I don't like you guys. You messed up from the beginning. My spirit's not going to always strive with you. You're mortals. You screw around. You screwed up. I wish I'd never made you. We have a very low self-image. We think we're original sinners groveling before an angry God, begging Him to forgive us and running to Jesus to protect us from that angry God. Further here, the, the children of Israel, i got to stop. They said to Moses, please, don't, don't let that God talk to us. We don't even want to be around that God. If He has anything to say to us, let Him say it through you. He's scaring the hell out of us. We don't want to, to be around that God at all. This is some two million people out in the wilderness. They haven't even entered the promised land yet. They're just going around. That God says when the cloud moves, you move. The cloud would, would make two million people break camp and move and then stop in the middle of the trip and make them set up camp and then an hour or two or three or a day or two, move again, gathering uh, skillets and pots and Clothes and donkeys and, and the Bible called them, King James called them asses and things. And, and horses and sheep and the foul odor and digging holes where they can, ex, can put their ex, they excrement and urinate and, and they had to procreate. And so, uh, it, they, it was crazy. If you look at the journey, it was crazy and has made crazy people on the planet because they believe in a God that is that consistently uh, irrational, irritated and irritating, paranoid, 
let's, let's open ourselves up to the revelation and elevation of a new understanding of God. Remember, as Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Are you willing to let's keep discussing? I have to deprogram you, to reprogram you. We have to unlearn a lot of stuff. We can't keep following the same way. We can change. I'm here to help facilitate that change with you and for you. I'll teach you more about Metacostalism, Unicostalism, about the new way of thinking, about the cultural creatives, about the sacred activists, about those who are spiritual progressives. If you're one of them, you should be. Let's stay in touch. For those of you who like what I'm saying, want to support it, please push the little uh, green button there, or it's red, whatever color it is, and make a donation quickly to the New Dimensions right now. Please help us expand and do more than we're doing so we can have more interactive sessions. I've been asking this for years, but not begging, and I'll never beg, but I want you to know that we appreciate what you got. I've taken a major list, almost risk, almost lost everything, but now I'm starting to sort of get my stuff together at 65. i got a daughter in college son that uh, came back home and is now working in a full-time job and I've had my own ups and downs but I'm doing good and I think my best and yours is yet and next to come God bless you God be you see you again next time